What are the central challenges and solutions for the energy transition? The energy market is in full transition. We are seeing decarbonization, increasing renewables, and improvements in infrastructure around the globe. This transition process is creating new challenges which need to be addressed. How do you provide clean and reliable energy at minimum cost? How do you adapt infrastructure to decentralized energy production? How do you flexibilize your system so that it can accommodate volatile renewable energy? Markets around the world showcase that finding the solutions for these challenges is certainly a mission possible. Thank you very much. I'd like to first start our conversation with um, the Director for Energy Transition Commissions, Ms. Faustine De La Salle, and she will begin the, give some introductory remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here today uh, among ministers. I feel uh, very humbled to be here. Um, I'm the director of an organization called the Energy Transitions Commission. And three years ago, a set of global leaders from across the energy landscape, energy consuming businesses, energy producing businesses, as well as equipment providers, finance players, and environmental NGOs, came together uh, to create this Energy Transitions Commission with the objective of figuring out whether they could, despite their differences, uh agree on a way forward to reach low carbon energy systems that would enable uh, energy for all. Um, so that was three years ago. Then in October last year, and we've heard about that this morning, the IPCC published a report showing the type of trajectories in terms of carbon emissions uh, that would be required to reach a 1.5 degree scenario. And we've heard this morning again how important it is to reach that 1.5 degree scenario and the fact that this is a life or death threat for some countries and populations, uh, including the Maldives um, about which we were speaking this morning. So that was published in October, and in November, the Energy Transitions Commission published a report that looked like a response to the IPCC report. And this report was called Mission Possible. And we concluded in this report that it is technically and economically feasible to reach net zero carbon emissions from the energy and industrial systems without relying on offsets from the land use sector globally by mid-century probably 2015 developed economies, 2016 developing economies. So I just want to run you through how we reached that conclusion. We reached that conclusion saying, well, there are four transition strategies that are required to get there. The first of these transition strategies is energy productivity improvement. The reason energy productive improvement matters is because the more progress we make in terms of how we use energy, uh, the less investment we will require to actually shift our energy systems to low carbon. So this is absolutely crucial. And it, we need a doubling of energy efficiency improvement rate globally. Um, and this can be done through energy efficiency technologies that exist, but there's also real untapped potential that we've uncovered uh, in the circular economy. Our calculations show that if uh, we were much more efficient in our use of materials, steel, cement, plastics, and recycled them better, we could reduce carbon emissions from heavy industry by 40% globally. That's not a marginal um, contribution to, to the fight against climate change. The second key transition, and we've heard a lot about it this morning, is power decarbonization. And here, uh, we published in 2016 an analysis that showed that it was possible to run grids relying on, at 85 to 90% on intermittent renewables. And this, in a cost competitive way, we were forecasting by 2035. Since then, I think the, the facts have caught up with us. And indeed, our, our chair is asking me to remove this analysis from our website because he feels we're now looking ridiculous because the facts have caught up with us too quickly. Uh, so car power decarbonization is definitely on the way. The third transition we then need is to use this clean power to electrify a greater number of sectors, and especially what we've called the easier to, ab to abate sectors, light duty vehicles, manufacturing uh, buildings, sectors for which electrified technologies already exist and are most of the time already uh, cost competitive or nearly so. 
And the fourth challenge is to decarbonize what we've called the harder to abate sectors. And I want to speak a bit more about that, given that that's the unknown uh, for most of us of the energy transition. How do you decarbonize heavy industry? How do you decarbonize heavy duty transport? We've deep dived on those topics for 18 months, looking at six sectors, cement, steel and plastics on the industry side, and heavy duty transport, shipping and aviation on the transport side. And our conclusion after large consultation with industry players is that this challenge is also technically feasible. We can reach net zero emissions from those sectors. There's a range of technologies out there in labs that can enable us to do so. And our initial calcula calculations show us that we would reach that objective with an overall cost of less than 0.5% of global GDP for those sectors that are the harder to abate sectors of the economy. And globally, these sectors can be solved through a range of four technical solutions. One is direct electrification, and we've actually discovered to our surprise that there's a much greater um, scope of activities that can be electrified than we initially thought. The second is use of biomass as an alternative for fossil fuels, although this solution yes, might yes, need to be very carefully managed given uh, the constraints on land use globally. And the third solution is carbon capture, uh, which will be required as part of the mix of solutions. And a fourth solution is the use of hydrogen. And we actually believe that the use of hydrogen could be multiplied uh, very significantly, possibly by 10 or more, uh, in the economy uh, by mid-century. And this hydrogen can in turn be produced either through electrolysis or through carbon capture. So it's actually a derivative of the other solutions. So we've reached the conclusion that this was all feasible. But feasible doesn't mean done, far from it. So I want to conclude by just highlighting a few of the challenges that we've uh, uncovered, and I hope this will be a good uh, basis for, for the following discussion. The first challenge is innovation. For a range of those sectors, the easier to abate sectors, uh, Innovations are already there, and technologies are already there. But what I want to highlight is that for us to have solutions in the late 2030s or 2040s for the harder to abate sectors of the economy, we need to invest today in the technologies that still need to reach markets. Um, so that's a particularly important challenge. The second one is obviously the cost differential uh, between green technologies and brown technologies. This is less and less of an issue in the power sector or in the line duty vehicle sector, but it is a very important issue, for instance, in heavy industry. And there are several ways of looking at this cost differential issue. You can think of carbon pricing as a solution, but you can also think as at the decrease in prices of renewables as a solution, because the lower the cost of your electricity, the lower the cost of for instance, electrifying or using hydrogen in industry. So cost of renewables can be an important factor. The third aspect is international competition. This is not relevant for all sectors, but it is particularly relevant for sectors like steel uh, or chemicals. Uh, and here, there are two political solutions to it that might not be very, um, very well thought through yet, and I think there's further thinking to be done on that front. One is border tax adjustments, if we can't find international solutions. The other is to actually regulate at end product level. If we start regulating the amount of steel that needs to go in a car, for instance, in, of green steel, instead of regulating steel production, then uh, we, would, we could go around the international national competitiveness issue, because it would apply to the steel used in cars wherever the steel is produced. The fourth question is stock flow issue. This is not much of an issue, for instance, in light duty vehicles. We change cars often enough, then the technologies will be deployed quite naturally once they are cost competitive. But it is a crucial issue, for instance, in industry, where plants uh, last 30, 40, 50 years, and there might be stranded assets. And the key question is, how do we actually pay for those stranded assets, and who pays for it? The fifth challenge I wanted to highlight is the scale of zero carbon power needs. Uh, because our conclusion is that a lot of the solution to decarbonize is actually to use clean power, either directly or indirectly through the use of hydrogen. 
but our calculations show that we could need to quadruple or quintuple uh, power production globally by mid-century, depending on how efficiently we use power. Uh, if that's the need, we not only need to decarbonize our current power production, we also need to meet all of that extra demand with renewables or with zero, other forms of zero carbon power. That's a hell of a challenge in terms of investment in the power sector. And finally, there will be winners and losers in terms of industries, but obviously also in terms of the regions where those industries are based. And one of the key questions uh, I suppose we'll come back to with the ministers around the table is how do we manage the redistributional effects of that transition? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I've heard some good news there that it is technically feasible. I, I really, I really want to take that, take that away. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be speaking on several languages on the panel here, so I just want to remind you that you have headsets available. We'll not be speaking in uh, just English. And then over here um, to my right, you will see a list of channels. Feel free to use the one that, uh, that suits you, the, the headsets are out in the back. Okay, we're going to um, begin, and uh, I'd like to start by asking the panelists to just give, uh, take five minutes with an introductory statement, perhaps react to what uh, has been put on the table by, um, by Faustine, but specifically I would like you to talk about your top three challenges, right? Let's not get into solution this round, and then we'll come into and spot, talk about the solutions. Maybe there'll be three solutions, maybe there'll be more. So your introductory statement, the top three challenges, okay? So I'd like the person to start our intervention to be um, Minister from Colombia, uh, Minister Suarez, if you could start us off, that would be fantastic. Hello. Okay, hello, good afternoon to everybody. First, thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, great event. Um, and I would like to highlight the effort that uh, the organization of this event has made to make an event that has 60% of participations uh, on, on, on the panels. Really, it's something that I ha haven't seen yet in any other event, really, in the energy sector, uh, we lack of women participation. So, so I would really like to highlight that. <laughs> well, going to our topic, I will say that regarding Colombia, Colombia is a place that it's full of challenges and full of opportunities simultaneously. So we have the sixth cleanest energy matrix in the world. Uh, because we have 70% of our electricity comes from hydro, 20% um, more or less from gas, and 10% out of coal. Even though we are a producer of coal, we do export 90% of our coal. And, but what that, what that drives us to, and that has been part of the discussion that we have heard during the morning, is that we are among the, one of the 20 most vulnerable countries to climate change. Uh, so those are part of the paradox, I will say, that because we're so clean, we are so vulnerable to climate change, in Nino phenomenon and so on, uh, we do suffer a lot. So first, we are, and, and we as a participation of the GDP and the total participation of Colombia in the total CO2 emissions is only 0.5%. So we alone cannot do anything to change what is driving towards the effects of climate change, but we will suffer uh, a lot from that. So 
how does that drive us into our government and energy agenda? So first, we have a full agenda regarding climate change and regarding how we will comply with our SDG goals for 2025 and 2030. And that not only for the whole country, but also for the energy sector, including the oil and gas sector, and including the electricity sector. And that's something that will be the driver of the agenda. I will see the guideline uh, in general. And, and from that, we have been setting an agenda regarding how to introduce variable renewables into our energy matrix. So we have been uh, in this process of doing two type of auctions. One auction that it's a reliability auction, that it's the, I will say, the common way that Colombia uses to expand its energy matrix. And on that auction, for the first time, we were able um, to achieve 1.4 gigabytes of wind and solar. So that's pretty cool. And that's around 7% of the total energy matrix. However, we need to make sure that we put in place some mechanisms for long-term contracts uh, to complement that reliability uh, payment that we have within country. And that's something that we're working through. Uh, we did have an auction of those long-term contracts on February, and it failed because there wasn't enough participation on the demand side. We want wanted to do a two-sided uh, auction, bid and offer, and uh, we didn't have enough uh, participation on the bid side. Um, and I do believe that Colombia has a huge opportunity because it's very rich on resources, both on wind and solar. Uh, on wind, just to give you an idea, on the north part of the country, we have onshore and offshore uh, opportunities for wind. And the average speed of the wind in La Guajira, that it's the north part of the country, it's two times the uh, average wind speed of the world. So definitely, there is a huge opportunity there. And also, because we are on the equator, uh, we do not have seasons. And, there, and, and we have places where the whole year, we have a lot of intensity of sun. So that is a big opportunity there. Uh, so we are making sure that we can build a full portfolio of energy generation that we can use our resources and make a diversification of the energy sources, of the electricity sources for our um, electricity matrix. And that will make us more resilient and uh, towards uh, climate change. And also, we hope that we can become an energy exporter, an electricity exporter. Um, we have interconnectivity with a transmission line with Ecuador, and we are working one uh, with Panama. Because we do believe that if we build together regional resources, that will make us more efficiency efficient uh, as a region. So that's definitely something that we're looking towards. Um, our challenges ahead. So the other two things will be uh, second access, and you have been speaking this morning about uh, equality and how energy access those drives equality, um, and really to achieve the sustainable and development goals, we cannot afford to have people not having energy access. In Colombia, we have still 400,000 families without energy access, and one million families that cook out of dirty sources, so wood or, or coal. Um, and, and, that access energy, and that access agenda, it's something that it's part of our, it's key on our agenda towards our equality agenda. Uh, and we're looking towards different options. I do believe that solar individual and microgrid solutions bring us an opportunity that we didn't have before, and we need to make sure that we speed up that agenda. And the third will be energy efficiency. So the, an energy efficiency, we see a lot of opportunities regarding um, the sector that I drive, that it's mining and hydrocarbons, how to make sure that what, however they have to keep uh, the pace on their activity, and that's something that we need to fully understand that we will need mining for a long time. Energy transition will depend a lot, a, lot, a lot on copper, for example. So there isn't an energy transition without mining. But we need to make sure that mining and hydrocarbon industry has the highest standard possible in able to make sure that they do their activity in the most sustainable way possible. And for that, we need to make sure that all technology and innovation is 
put in place in those places to make sure that we can deliver in those ways. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. There's a yes, yes. Lots, lots going on in Colombia. I think the real mission impossible is to talk about challenges without solutions. I think that's what I'm getting. So maybe I will just allow the interveners to, 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 to discuss challenges as well as solutions together. I could see that from the ministers, like I'm not going to just talk about problems without their corresponding solution. So I'd like uh, the next uh, person to, to give the introductory comment from uh, the point of view of Serbia is... Um, Ivica Dekic, the Prime Minister from Serbia. So if you could give your comments as well, that would be fantastic. Thank you. I am the only Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, here in this company. And I came upon the invitation of Mr. Heiko Maas, and I was left by him here with the ministers of energy. But energy and politics have always been connected. No crisis, no political crisis uh, has gone without consequences for energy or vice versa. All energy crises have always had elements of political crisis. I come from a country of Serbia a country which, of course, uh, one of the consequences uh, of not having the sea, as a consequence of climate change, it could get a sea, but this would, of course, mean a catastrophe for the neighboring countries, including my colleague from North Macedonia. Nevertheless, bearing in mind that it is sure that the global warming does not depend either of Serbia or North Macedonia, but mostly depends on the richest and biggest countries in the world. We join all the conventions which, which are of significance for this area, such as the climate accord. But I would only like to pinpoint a few issues. First issue, Serbia in its energy policy regarding the strategy for the development of energy, first of the things is to ensure energy security, to have stable energy supply. The second question is the development of the energy markets and third, of course, the transition is something sustainable in energy. To go point by point, we are faced with the problem of supplying sufficient energy. In the case of Serbia, we are speaking of oil and gas. Just like the European Union in all, Serbia, maybe even a bit more, has the need to import gas. We only provide 20% 20, 20 of the domestic use with the gas which is produced in Serbia. At the same time, this transport system of natural gas to Serbia has only one entrance it comes from Hungary, that is, it comes from Russia via Ukraine. And this is when this becomes a political issue. What will happen if the announcement on the halt of gas supply from Ukraine become true. This is why we are very attentive. We pay close attention to all the progress, to all the projects uh, which can allow our country to have stable natural gas su supply. Uh, we also closely follow projects in which we are not end users as a country of transit, which of course 
would be very positive for the energy stability of the entire region. But I would also like to underline certain problems which are, are not encompassed by the issue of energy. I have to say, this problem is a problem of double standards when it comes to our need to import Russian gas and your need to import gas from Russia. When I say your, I mean the European Union. We face the situation in which political differences regarding this issue uh, have led to the obstruction of this project, which was highly useful for Serbia. And I'm speaking of the southern stream. We are in a very unfavorable position because for us, gas does not have a national symbol, does not have national significance. For Serbia, and I'm sure for North Macedonia or Bulgaria as well, this is a main issue of everyday life. How will we get gas? And of course, the, the issue of Russia and Russia's influence through gas is as important. But if Russia doesn't influence you through gas, who are supplied by a North Stream, I don't see why it would be a problem for you if we make a South Stream or Turkish Stream. Does our gas, does the gas which come to Serbia will bring more problems than the gas which comes to you. This is the question I raise because the Nord Stream was exempt from the third energy package, whereas the South Stream did not. Do you think that we don't have the right to gas? If you don't allow us to have Russian gas, give us someone else's. Give us someone else's gas. And where from? Where from is a question? Yes, there is none. This is the problem. So this is one part of the issue. We need gas. Another part of the issue, that bearing in mind that we don't have enough gas, we have to to use other means of energy and ways of producing energy by using coal, hard fossil fuels. This is how we compensate for the lack of energy sources. And this is how we give our contribution to the environment pollution. This is why I believe it is of highest significance to have the connectivity, a strategic connectivity. We need diversification of sources, of the routes for energy supply. We need interconnectivity between different countries when it comes to energy market, speaking, of, of course, about the countries in our region. And the third thing is, speaking about the energy transition, transition towards clean technologies which would lead to better results to reduce uh, harmful gases reduction from 60,000 tons of harmful gases such as CO2, uh, Serbia has managed to reduce um, its contribution in this regard. This is our contribution to fighting climate change. Thank you. What I'm hearing is a continuation of the geopolitical um, discussion that we just had. And I'm also seeing this interconnectedness between you know, the energy transition and the political repercussions. So thank you for those 
for those remarks. I'm going to ask uh, my other panelists to kindly, you know, keep your comments quite short, otherwise it is possible that we will not have, all of us have a chance to really get on to the mission possible um, discussion. But uh, I certainly appreciate, and I think the audience says, the interconnectedness of the issues, right? So the next uh, person to give your intervention, sir, is um, you, Dr. Kocho, and uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Mo North Macedonia. Again, if you could keep your comments uh, fairly contained, then we will have a second round to, to uh, um, expound. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. It's a big pleasure for me to be part of this uh, event. It's uh, really uh, the huge number of people here presented, and uh, this shows the interest of, uh, for this event. I will start with uh, some, I can say, choke that we find uh, the more effective way to fight uh, to, to uh, fight against climate changes. We changed the country name in North Macedonia, and now because we have North in name, uh, automatically become a few degrees centigrade colder, and it's, <laughs> this problem is solved. <laughs> But <laughs> is, is, of course, not. It's, it's choke, and on this way, we are helping on our neighboring countries also. <laughs> but uh, to be realistic, uh, of course, this issue is uh, the big uh, issue in the whole world, and especially for the small countries like our country. North Macedonia has only 2. Point, uh, something million people, uh, citizens, and, uh, and uh, from this point of view, uh, if we want to say something specifically, I think that it's most important to say that uh, all of us, we know how we can replace, I can say, dirty technologies for producing electricity, because all of us, we know uh, uh, about uh, existing technologies. Those technologies are very really well known. And uh, of course, uh, depend on the natural resources in uh, our country, it's uh, sun. That means it's uh, very convenient for uh, installing the photovoltaics, also wind. Uh, for, from the point of view of the hydropower plants, uh, we use uh, almost the uh, main part of the hydro potential in the big hydropower plants and also in the small hydropower plants, creating or designing and also implementing uh, in, um, in, 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 uh, in the real projects uh, more than 100 small hydropower plants and a few big hydropower plants. But uh, we have a lot of space in uh, photovoltaics and uh, in, the, in the wind energy, but the main question is not about technology. This is well known. And uh, fortunately, in the last period and last years, this, uh, the price of this equipment become cheaper and cheaper, what is good information in this moment. But uh, the main question is uh, not technology, not uh, technical skills. The main question is how we can implement this without big effect to the price of electricity for the final customer. This is the main question. And you and we know about few models. The, the model for the feeding tariffs, this model affects the price for the final customer, especially for the countries, the poor countries, where the, the citizens are not very strong to pay uh, this uh, price of electricity. The second one is uh, that will be subsidized directly by the budget, what is again some kind of uh, subsidies or incentive uh, for investors, because you will find a lot of investors in the world if they can uh, uh, be sure that their projects are feasible and they can return their money. This is this is main question in this process. This is the first question, and we find a way. I can, I want to inform all pre, all uh, participants here, which is present in this hall, that uh, we switch uh, our model from feeding tariff to premium tariffs. Will be on the auction process, and we try to decrease the investment cost capex of the investors on the way where we, like the government, we will uh, give them uh, land free of charge and. Uh, uh, organize for all investors uh, all administrative procedures in the country free of charge. On this way, we can decrease their capex, and also we will put this on the auction procedure. Procedure that means that will be 
transparent tendering procedure uh, where uh, the criteria in the tendering procedure will be the premium which they are asking over the market price. That means that any investor can sell the, his electricity on the market because market is liquid now in, this, in our region and over this price they will obtain the premium and premium will be the uh, criteria for the tendering procedure. We issue the tendering procedure for first 62 megawatts install capacity, which is small, but take into consideration that we are also a small country, means a lot, because until now we have only 18 megawatts install capacity in photovoltaics, and the potential is uh, up to 300 megawatts, this is the plan, and 300 megawatts install capacity is appro approximately 30% of the whole install capacity in the country. And uh, taking this into consideration, first 62 megawatts will be issued, the tendering procedure will start this, uh, this month. And I'm using this opportunity to invite all uh, potential investors to, to invest and uh, to participate on this tendering procedure. The second big issue, and I will uh, uh, finish my discussion for uh, half minutes, let's say, the second big, big issue is stability of the system. Because how you are increasing the install capacity in uh, renewable energy, renewable energy with today possibility for forecast, whether forecast is predictable, but unfortunately it's not controllable. You can predict, but you are not able to control. And from this point of view, you need to think about stability of the system. Because in the Balkan region, we have a lot of small countries. In this case, we need the second approach. The second approach is to have a regional approach for balancing mechanism for uh, uh, keep the system stable. This is very important. And in this direction, we think a lot in this moment and we are communicate a lot in the region how to organize the common electricity market where we will have the common stock exchange for electricity to uh, uh, avoid all problems which we have with the stability if we are thinking alone like small country, all of us. For this point of view, we are discussing for uh, uh, make the margins of the markets between now between North Macedonia and Bulgaria in the first stage, after that Greece and I hope also Serbia in future and uh, Montenegro. And I think that this is crucially important because without taking care about the uh, stability of the system and the secondary regulation uh, of uh, the consequences of the renewable energy, I think that uh, their development is not possible. This is also very important and of course we have to think about the uh, strong infrastructure, infrastructure for, 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 for transfer electricity to the, to the final customer. If I, if I need to to, to find only three main topics for, for uh, developing renewable energy, it, I think that those three topics are very important. First of all, the, how we can find the mechanism to, to, to make uh, the project attractive for investors. The second one is for the small countries especially, how we can keep stability of the system, and third, investment in infrastructure for connecting, because you know, Sometimes the windmills are on the top of the mountain, they have to be connected to the, to the grid, and this is sometimes significant uh, expensive in comparison with investment. Okay, thank you very much for now, thank you and I much. hope that we will have opportunity later on to discuss more. No, Thanks. thank you very much. I want to add, thank you, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. From your first point, I want to add, you know, if we're taking notes, affordability. It's really, I really took that point that North Macedonia is looking at how to make this project affordable for its citizens. Otherwise, there's really no point. Thank you very much for that. Uh, okay, so we'll now move to Iraq. And I would like to ask uh, kindly Dr. Al-Khatib to give us his remarks. Thank you very much, Linda. It's always great to be here in Berlin. Reflecting on the title of the session, Mission Possible, I recall uh, five months ago when Prime Minister Adel Abdel Mahdi of Iraq, um, he was designated PM by then, uh, asking me to join the administration. I was given 10 seconds to say yes or no. 
and take my flight and join the cabinet. It was a, he said, you have the opportunity to join a Ten mission, seconds, yeah. a mission possible. And um, together we can make it possible. And I think he's right and, and uh, there are a lot of opportunities in Iraq to uh, play a pivotal role, not only to sustain its own demand, but also to support uh, global energy and um, economic security at large, and I'll come to this point. The first three challenges I would, I mean, you mentioned about, to mention top, or top three challenges uh, that um, any country could face. I mean, our country, for example, I would say the ill-informed narrative, the wrong perception, and the legacy mindset that imposed and governed uh, Iraq for many years. The, I'll, and I'll give examples about this. The ill-informed um, uh, narrative, it's, for example, when a, a, a major delegation that comes from a, a very important country to visit Iraq to promote business and attract its own business community, yet at the same time, its own embassy issues a warning on its website to say, don't come to Iraq, uh, and it's a red zone as we speak. The wrong perception is, is the fact that we are a rich resource country and its own people think it's a natural and a national right to enjoy free electricity, free petrol, free services as if like oil and gas is, a, uh, is, a per is something that is uh, granted to every single country on planet Earth. The, the perception of the business community that Iraq is a red zone and should not be approached and life is completely um, not normal and it's a dangerous place. All these need to be changed. And I would like to use this platform to issue a, a, a message to the international community that Iraq is open for business and Iraq is, is, is moving on to um, improve its conditions. Yes, it, was a, uh, it went through a bad time. It, uh, a, a transnational terrorist group imposed uh, its war uh, on it to take its toll on all infrastructure, specifically on the electricity side which destroyed literally 20 to 25 percent of its infrastructure on that side. But we have the resources and we have the capability to move on. The security of Iraq, uh, the economic security of Iraq is not a, a local issue, it's a global issue. If Iraq is secured, which means f 5 percent of oil production we will continue to pump and sustain global demand. This volume of production cannot be replaced by any spare capacity available today. And if Iraq's security is compromised, that means a major crisis will impact on global security and global economy. Because no country can afford to pay high prices or no investment could sustain its business on fluctuated market. So stability, it's, a, it's not a, an Iraqi affairs, it's a global necessity that everyone should really think about that. This country also on track of developing further capabilities in terms of like oil production and as well as gas. We've seen earlier in this presentation by Dr. Fatah Barol, uh, the global demand on energy will, is on the rise and it's currently year on year around 2.3% and mostly from fossil fuel, which means oil and gas will remain to be key player in the foreseeable future. On the gas side, 
um, the 80 percent of it of Iraq's um, um, reserves is very much proven reserves is linked to um, um, to oil. It's an associated gas, but the potential of um, uh, of non-associated gas are there. The country is completely under under explored, and the market condition um, basically will change um, in the in the coming years because laws and, and regulations are changing. Unfortunately, back to the perception and the wrong narrative, or ill-informed narrative, should I say, is that people think when dictatorship and tyranny was removed from Iraq back in 2003, things should happen on a fast-track mode and it should be developed. We're talking about a country that came out of a half a century of dictatorship, tyranny, military rule, sanctions, wars, you name it. This developed generations that they are yet to change their own mindset to accept the new world, new market economy, and, uh, the real democracy, not chaotic democracy, and so on. And this, this will require a generation or two, but progressively speaking. So <clears throat> the, the opportunities are there. The, Politics in Iraq is improving, and it's completely, I'm not saying it's, the, uh, it's, it's a rosy picture there, but certainly not the ugly scene that the media and the general narrative depicting on screen. It's a place, I personally, I'm a senior official member of the uh, federal government, and most of the time, other than uh, of, uh, official duties, I walk around without security details. So I, I wanted to mention this and highlight that Iraq is, is open and the size of opportunity for reconstruction is around 1.5 trillion US dollars and this could bail out by a rich resource country that could finance that uh, bill in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Again, we're seeing a continuing theme from this morning. You know, the energy transition, energy is very much interconnected with political systems, geopolitics. We're seeing that coming through. And obviously, as the countries are speaking here, some of their challenges are, are you know, not what you might, uh, you might expect. I certainly resonate with the idea of uh, tribal advisories as a person living in Kenya, you know, where thinking, well, we're trying to move forward, but um, you know uh, um, these travel advisories are inconsistent with some of our goals. Thank you for those comments. Now we do not have much much time, but I still want to give an opportunity to hear from our last uh, sort of three remaining panelists that we haven't haven't heard from. I really it, it's just so important that. Uh, we hear your challenges, your solutions as well, what you're doing, and then we'll figure out how we'll tie it all together. So over to you, China. Mr. Okay, I Mr. Li Shankin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, guests. Firstly, on behalf of part of China, I'd like to introduce myself and what we're doing. In China, when it comes to the energy transition, we've been um, working very hard and I want to talk about what we've achieved so far. I'd also like to talk about our experiences. You are all aware that China is an energy exporter, but it's, at the same time it's one of the biggest consumers worldwide. So what we're trying to do in the energy policy is to create uh, reliable energy security. Uh, we're trying to make sure that we have clean energy and environmentally friendly policies. So we're trying to uh, uh, doing absolutely everything we can. We will not cease to endeavor in these areas. Currently, we have 110 gigawatts uh, generator capacity, installed capacity, capacity that we have got rid of of dirty uh, power stations. So we've closed that many power stations and we've almost completed all of those projects. 
At the same time, uh, in the area of, China, of Chinese clean energy, we have a generator capacity of uh, approximately 700 gigawatts that we have installed. This is the leading figure worldwide, and I believe that ch that puts uh, China at the forefront in clean energy. In our overall energy mix in China, we have a fossil fuel currently, we have a share of fossil fuels that is declining constantly in, in overall consumption. So the, uh, the Paris Agreement uh, is very important to us and we're trying to make our contribution. Uh, of course, we want to improve our work even further and to, uh, to bring things even further. It's a, a major challenge uh, for us. We've got lots of challenges that are coming at us in the future. In particular, we have seen that uh, implementing the Paris Climate Agreement uh, is going to mean an enormous amount of, uh, of extra work for us. So that means that we have got a, a great deal of, um, of work to do ahead of us. Signing the Paris Agreement uh, has meant a major commitment to us, and we are always trying to make sure that we um, uh, that we fulfil our commitments that we have made already. We believe that the peak uh, uh, emissions year for us will be 2030. However, we very much hope that we're going to be able to reduce that amount by 60 to 65 percent. So we're not going to leave our commitments, we're going to do absolutely everything uh, in our power in order to make sure that we do achieve these goals. At the same time, in renewables, uh, we're going to uh, focus in wind uh, energy and photovoltaic. We are again world leader in installed capacity in those areas. However, we are still making efforts uh, in the area of energy prices and to make sure that, uh, that, that the market is attractive and that we are competitive and that that is a trend that increases in the future. So, of course, we, uh, it's very important that worldwide that people look at China and look at the, China, the situation in China. We, uh, we have a, an east-west expansion and north-south expansion, uh, we, uh, a, uh, a, a land area. We have around 5,000 kilometers to cover, to go from the top of the country to the bottom of the east to the west. So that means that the, 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 um, the heavily burdened areas are the, in the east, but where the energy is actually produced is very, very far away in the southwest of the south of China. So transferring this energy over vast distances is a very particular challenge for China as a country. Uh, when it comes to energy consumption and energy generation, there's a lot of work for us to do. We need to make sure that we adapt prices as well. The aim is to also reduce uh, uh, losses in energy in, 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 in the grid and in transferring energy. So we are taking lots of steps at the moment. Uh, firstly, we, we can see that the, uh, the, the, the commitments that we have, have, have made in the Paris Agreement, however, we are able to implement them and we will continue to do so. In the area of clean energies, we have about 25% uh, uh, to 30% and we're going to bring that up to over 50% while fossil energy, uh, fossil fuels are going to be reduced even further. So uh, renewable energy for us is mostly wind and solar energy. We've had a lot of very uh, positive results so far. We've uh, the the products the, the the plants that we've actually got up and running so far uh, have been very successful. Prices from PV are at the same level as conventional energy sources. So for us, that is a wonderful report, and the government will no longer have to for, uh, continue to subsidize energy prices from renewables. It's not the case all across the country. We still have a lot of work to do in order to stabilize and reduce energy prices per kilowatt uh, hour. 
and also to ensure the competitiveness of renewable sources. Our general problem is that the uh, the, the main centres of population and, and of consumption are in the east, and we have um, production sites that are very far away. So. We are very reliant, therefore, on, on PV and on wind energy. We want to make sure that we have a, a, a more appropriate structure for, for the east and west of, of China. And that's the principle that we're currently working towards. So at this point, I would just like to say that we will continue to focus on clean energy and we will continue also to focus on reducing consumption overall. This is going to be our direction. We are going to pursue these goals and make sure that we contribute uh, to efforts worldwide. Uh, certainly, when we come to Mission Possible, I don't think there's anyone in the room that doubts that China can do what they set their minds out to do. So thank you very much for your commitment, your recommitment to the Paris Agreement. Now, before I cede the floor to the next two speakers who will share five minutes, uh, I mean, te uh, maybe about, what, nine minutes each, um, I just want to remind the audience about the Mentometer. We, we, we are really wanting to hear what you're thinking with the poll question, so kindly engage with that. Continue to engage engage with Twitter, because we're going to have a discussion about that, and then we're going to close our session after we have heard your opinion about what you're hearing on the stage today. Okay, so now we will now come back to Europe, and we will start with interventions from Turkey. So, Deputy Minister Alparsan Beyrak Tar, would you kindly take the floor? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to talk about Turkish energy transition. If you look at our energy transition history, we have two eras. First, we started like 17 years ago, uh, and it was mainly a market transformation, market transition. And what we have done was changing our vertically integrated state monopoly model into a competitive market model. And we unbundled old market activities we decreased eligibility tr threshold gradually each and every year. We privatized with relevant state enterprises. So basically, we applied all necessary tools for market liberalization. It wasn't an easy process. It wasn't so smooth because, we, first, we have witnessed a very significant price increase in power markets due to full cost reflectivity. So lesson number one or challenge number one and main challenges for initial energy transition, cost-reflective pricing. Secondly, we try to incentivize renewables in an optimal and more balanced way, not to create additional and significant market distortion. We had been criticized in Turkey 10 years ago that our renewable support scheme and fit-in tariff figures were very low. And today, Still, we are being criticized, and people are complaining about the same feed-in tariff figures, but now they are complaining that these figures are too high and uh, creating distortion for market prices. So lesson number two, optimal level of support or incentives for new technologies. Ten years ago, we were discussing renewable support scheme. Now, batteries, electric vehicles, demand-side management tools, or like a carbon capture, utilization, and storage. So we need to be careful on that. At the end of the first transition period, we were able to implement successfully all relevant market reforms. And during this period, our energy market attracted more than $60 billion of investment only for power generation assets. Our wind and solar install capacity went up to 15.2% from 0%. IPP's market share, independent power producers' market share, went from 25% to 80%. And we have a very historic three hours. April 1st, 2018, in Turkey, 63% of electricity supply came from renewable only. So it was a great achievement. Both domestic and foreign investors, as well as financial institutions, believed in our energy market and supported our market reforms. 
and in general, they had confidence in our economy. And lesson number three, or challenge number three, political will and commitment, as well as long-term vision on energy policy are key for successful energy transition. So Turkey completed this first phase of its energy market transition, which I call it Transition 1.0. And in 2017, two years ago, we announced a new energy and mining policy. I call it Transition 2.0. It has three main pillars, security of supply, utmost utilization of local resources, mainly renewables, and of course, market predictability. It was the most comprehensive and most integrated energy policy document in Turkish history. It includes many macroeconomic and social policy aspects, job creation, manufacturing, R&D in energy, business opportunities for small and medium-sized enterprises. These were all addressed in this policy document. And we have very ambitious renewable targets. Over the next 10 years, we would like to add 10 gigawatt of solar and 10 gigawatt of wind power generation into our energy mix. Also in 2018, it was very historic again, our government announced Energy Efficiency Action Plan. It includes different sectors from energy to buildings, transportation, agriculture, industry, and many cross-cutting sectors with five, 55 different actions. And we would like to aim to attract investment to energy efficiency area roughly $11 billion over the next five, six years. In the meantime, the aim is to reduce our primary energy consumption by 14%, and hopefully we will reduce also 66 million tons of carbon emissions. I, I can continue, but maybe for the uh, solutions part in the second round, I will uh, yeah. touch upon our solutions. Thank you very Thank much, you. sir. Excellent. Okay, let's now have introductory remarks from the State Secretary for Energy in Portugal. Hi, good afternoon to you all. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank the German Renewable Energy Federation for the invitation to this event. Um, uh, luckily, I was the last one to speak because it allows me to contrast the, the, my country's experience with the, the previous interventions. And um, luckily, I am from a, a small country with no geopolitical problems that doesn't have that doesn't produce oil or gas. So we don't have sec second thoughts on whether this renewable thing is a good idea or not. We don't have a, we don't have an option, and um, and we are fully integrated in the European Union fully integrated with its um, uh, policy priorities. Uh, and we, we start all of this with almost 60% already in our um, electricity production coming from renewable sources. So I would say, in comparison, that we have um, an easy life compared to previous interventions in this panel. Um, what, uh, what we're doing in Portugal at the moment is that we've, uh, we've approved in line with the other um, uh, uh, European Union members the, the Climate and Energy Plan. And we've tried to organize our energy transition um, first with the main strategic goals and, uh, and uh, with the energy and uh, with the climate and energy plan. And then uh, that plan is fully integrated with the uh, DSO and TSO's investment um, plans in order for them to plan the, the grid development in accordance with the, with the goals and the strategic objectives of the climate and energy plan. And, um, and afterwards, and now I'm talking just about solar, we, uh, in line with taking into account the goals and the investment plans of the DSO and the TSO, we'll auction the available ca uh, capacity coming out of those same investment plans. Uh, and, well, we'll do auctions and we'll we fulfill our, our goals presented in the climate and energy plan. The main challenge for now for Portugal is this. We are in a very weird situation because we are one of the countries in Europe with the highest solar potential, and we are probably one of the countries in Europe with the lowest 
lowest uh, uh, installed capacity of solar. Uh, we have twice as much sun as Germany and we have only 500, 600 megawatts of solar. This compares with 7,000 7, megawatts of hydro and 6,000 megawatts of, of wind. So we, we have a, a long way to go in solar. The good news is that we have the resources and we just have to, uh, well, we just have to start with the auctions, which we'll do uh, starting this June. We'll do two regular auctions per year. Um, in line with the objectives in the, the climate and energy plan. Uh, the main uh, um, uh, challenge, apart from increasing renewable capacity in line with those objectives, is of course to prepare the grid for uh, inter intermittent uh, renewable sources, but we have a, a great experience, experience in that because we have had many, many, many days above 100% of, of renewable energy in our grid. Uh, so we have the experience and now we're just actually adding more solar. Um, and uh, the biggest challenge is after we've added uh, or during the process of adding solar to our energy mix, which already includes a lot of hydro and wind, it's to provide flexibility to the grid, which we are actually doing uh, uh, right now. Uh, we want to regulate uh, uh, storage because it's not regulated in Portugal. We are allowing storage right now uh, for the, 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 the solar auctions. You can include storage in the, in the, in the, in the, in the projects. Uh, so this is basically what you're doing. Increasing capacity, uh, uh, guaranteeing that the grid will be able to accommodate these in, in increases, increased percentages of intermi intermittent uh, uh, renewable power sources. We want to do an auction next, next year just uh, uh, for storage. Um, but I think starting from where we're starting with already 60%, 57% of renewables in, in, uh, in total uh, electricity production, I think we, we have the skills and the experience to make the, the impossible possible. Oh, Thank wonderful. You. Great finish. Thank you very much. So we've heard a diversity of challenges and a diversity of experiences from, uh, from our panelists here. And uh, one of the themes that I was getting is depending on where you are on the geopolitical maps, your challenges tend to be um, you know, definitely quite, quite different and contrasted. So that's sort of what we prepared for you from our panelists, but we really want to hear what you th you're thinking. And to help me to, uh, disc um, have a discussion on that, I'd like to invite my colleague, uh, Mr. Dialog, who will reflect back what it is that you're saying on Twitter, what is it that you're saying on the poll, and then I'll ask the panelists to react specifically to some of the key things that Mr. Dialog is going to point out. And then we'll do a lightning round of 30 seconds you close out anything you didn't get a chance to say, you literally have 30 seconds before we have to go to the next session. Okay, thank you, Linda. Uh, this is your last chance to take part in the three questions, so uh, please point your devices in that direction if you haven't done so already. Um, I would also like to start off with a couple of tweets, just because uh, we are now at the point in the conference when a number of things are happening outside of this room. Uh, there are competing sessions, but there is also, for instance, if we can get this up on the wall, um, for instance, the four Foreign Office, where we're sitting right now, has just tweeted that they are meeting with the representatives of the Maldives to talk about the security implications of climate change. So meetings like that are also going on in the background. Uh, another one of the sessions that's going on uh, turned out to be an all-woman panel, an all-female panel, um, and that was very much appreciated. Um, we, uh, they, they specifically spoke about um, here we have, for instance, a German magazine, Erneuerbare Energien, um, and they are, are specifically talking about, I don't have that over here on the, 
the screen there. Um, beyond electricity, making the transition work in all sectors. Uh, so there are interesting discussions going on outside there as well. Uh, there's another uh, good news source for what's happening in Germany. It's called Clean Energy Wire. And we have some of their representatives also uh, walking around talking uh, to interesting people with some uh, uh, interesting discussions there that they're reporting on. So you can also use Twitter to see what else is happening outside of this room. Now I need the little flicker here, and we'll move over to the Menti poll, if we can get that up. All right, so let's see what the biggest challenges for the energy transition are, and that turns out to be political will, and this was also something that I saw from Twitter that someone else was claiming on one of the panels, that political will is the biggest optical. Uh, obstacle. Do you feel that your country is on a good path with the energy transition? And we have overwhelming agreement that uh, we still have our work cut out for us. So uh, at least we accept the facts. We could put it that way. Uh, in which energy sector do you see the most need? And it turns out to be transport. Uh, that's the great consensus here. I personally would have said heat, but okay. Uh, we can talk about it. All right, so I'll hand back over to Linda now, and we can go through with the final comments from the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. You Thank you very much. Thanks for participating. We definitely want to see the number of participants go up. I think we're about 60, 70 of us participating, so the more of your opinions we can get, the better the sample size across. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, first and foremost, as you give your closing remarks, do you agree with, certainly the first one, whether it's a political will? Do you agree that transportation in your respective country is where we need to be spending um, the most time? Right? So if you can react to, to what has been said, but certainly give us your parting shorts, your closing remarks. Again, we only have maybe 30 seconds per, per speaker. So, who would like to start? How about I give, I give the opportunity to, to somebody with a burning comment? Ladies first. Ladies first. Okay, I think you've been volunteered, Minister Suarez. Um, okay, well, regarding political will, I will just say that part of the challenges that we have as policymakers is making sure that we can innovate uh, at the same time that we are predictable because we that have a private sector that is an investor in the electricity sector, that is definitely a challenge uh, to keep the pace. Um, we do have the political will, but definitely we can be more aggressive in terms of the goals that we can achieve due to the opportunities that we have. Thank you very much. Keeping it short and sharp. Okay. Next, who would like to go after Minister Suarez? I'm going to ask the representative from... Turkey. Port Turkey, not Portugal. Yes. Turkey. Uh, thank you. Just, uh, I would like to emphasize in energy transition, I believe there is no one-size-fits-all solution. That's a key thing. Yes, I agree with the political will and commitment is key success factor here. But every country, as you said also in your uh, speech, that every country has their own specifics, their own challenges, and, and all their own capabilities and opportunities. So we need to respect all these uh, differences. Long-term vision, more integrated policy, and of course the country's adaptive capacity are crucially important. But one thing I, I think we haven't discussed in here, uh, that inclusiveness and consumer empowerment, engagement with the citizens also quite crucial for energy transition. Last but not least, continue to own market reforms, more innovation and out-of-box thinking, uh, or in other words, like a mindset change, as Dr. Lie mentioned in his opening remarks, for all stakeholders are key for having a better energy future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, from uh, Turkey. From Portugal. Oh, Portugal. Turkey was previously. I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon. Uh, um, um, I, I agree with uh, that political will is the most important, and I, and I would add that actually what is most disruptive in energy transition is not technology, it's politics. 
because it's politics that sets the goal, it's politics that has to be persistent, it's politics that need to organize, it's politics that need to mobilize all the efforts. So what's really disruptive here, more than technology, is politics, because we need a new type of politics, but with an, with an, old, with an old ingredient that we cannot let go, which is politics needs to show to the citizens that this is actually an opportunity, not a threat, not a concern, but uh, an opportunity that will not threaten the lifestyle, but do the opposite, actually provide um, well, all our citizens with new opportunities, and this is really an economic and uh, labor opportunity for all. I would say that that is the most crucial side and the most disruptive also. Thank you. Thank you. Short and sharp. Yes, sir. Okay, very fast. Uh, first of all, I agree that political wish is uh, something crucial. And I said also in my previous discussion that uh, political wish means how the government can uh, secure environment for financing and find way how to make the project feasible for an investor and also not to have the big impact to the price of the price of electricity for the final customer. This is the what government must secure, but I don't believe in the governmental investments. I believe in private investment in this area, and because this investment uh, created the liquid market, uh, liberalized market, and uh, this is this is my suggestion. And uh, any energy transition in any country, and doesn't exist receipt for all over the world. It's tailor-made solution for any country. This is very important, and. Uh, also, I don't agree with the second uh, column that uh, transportation is, uh, uh, I can say, with the biggest potential for reduction, uh, for the, I can say, renewable energy, maybe for climate changes, for the reduction of climate changes. But what means if we can change the vehicles, uh, I don't know, diesel engine vehicles with electric vehicles, if we charge these vehicles on the electricity produced by the thermal power plants or coal. Yeah. What is the potential here? Zero, because here ratio of efficiency is more than 50% in diesel engine, here is only 32%. That means even we have worse situation, we have to take into consideration this. Yes, in the vehicle, with electrical vehicle, but charged by the renewable energies. Yeah. That is all. Thanks. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yes, any other interventions? Sir, go on. My opinion is that the energy transition is, of course, very important and that political will is essential. But nevertheless, I think that it's important that the economy and also science need to play a very important role. And this is happening in different ways. So new technologies, for instance, need to be adopted. For instance, this is the case for hydrogen. So this is really something that will be a breakthrough technology. And this is essential. Thank you very much. No, I, do, I definitely do agree. Um, OK. Dr. Al-Khatib, do you want to give your uh, remarks? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I couldn't agree more on the political will. I think um, in the context of Iraq uh, being surrounded by six countries, either consumers, producer, or transit countries, uh, when it comes to the energy play, uh, certainly uh, the energy transition requires the collective effort and cooperation with all partners with the right um, uh, commercial coalition, I think not only Iraq could build, rebuild itself, but the region could trans to be transformed into a, a vibrant uh, energy hub and a, a region uh, for peace uh, as opposed to um, a region of uh, wars and troubles. Thank you. I'm going to kindly ask the Prime Minister if you have some final, final words that you want to share with the conference. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that unfortunately we cannot discuss other questions until we resolve the question of energy supply until we have sufficient energy. 
that is, we are faced with the issue that we will not have gas any soon. And at the same time, we cannot say that everyone has the same level of understanding for this issue. Down the same line, whether we will use new technologies, whether we will use new energy sources depends on economic development of the country. You know, earlier, in the past, the most impoverished layers of people ate black bread and the richest parts of the population would eat white bread. Today, at least in Serbia, this, is, this was the case. Today, the rich people eat the black bread because it's healthier. And the poorer eat the white bread. This may be more delicious, more tasty, but it is not healthier. This is why this has all been directed towards rich countries. What you have earned in the market of less developed countries, you can use now to help these countries to advance, that the technology be advanced, so that we can all have equal conditions to live in a healthy environment. As a politician, I, I welcome you all. I'm not a minister of energy, but without energy, we already have a political crisis. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we started our session with Ms. Faustine setting the stage, and it's only fitting that we allow her to give the final remarks. What I wanted to conclude on is this is mission possible. Technologically, this is possible. We have solutions in every sector, including in the harder to abate sectors, heavy industry, heavy duty transport. But this is only feasible as we, if we have political will. And it was very encouraging to hear on this panel the amount of political will, especially from China, from the European Union, and European countries. This is essential. We need to remember this is an industrial revolution in front of us, like any industrial revolution, it will create disruptions, but it will also create a huge amount of economic opportunities. And I wanted to finish on that note. Thank you very much.